one. Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar series presented by Metering and Smart Energy International. We are very lucky today to be joined by two key industry speakers who are going to share some insights into what the Internet of Things means, its impact on the utilities industry, and its infiltration into the very core of utility business operations. I'm Claire Falkvane, Managing Editor of Metering and Smart Energy International. And joining me today are Neil Struther, who is a Principal Research Analyst in the Energy Practice at Navigant Research, and Elena Vasconi, who is the Principal Marketing Consultant with ITRON's CTO office. Now, Navigant's Research Energy Technologies program focuses on new technologies and business models that are driving innovation across a number of uh, energy sectors, including clean energy and energy storage both on a utility scale and a distributed uh, energy uh, basis. And ITRON is the leading, one of the leading technology and service companies dedicated to the resourceful use of energy and water and by providing comprehensive solutions that measure, manage, and analyze energy and water, the company is able to help utilities responsibly and efficiently manage resources. The missions for the CTO office deal with uh, security, new, new business innovation, and new generation architecture. So I think that we are in very, very good hands as far as the Internet of Things is concerned. Neil, I'm going to hand over to you to start us off for this afternoon. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, I'm going to advance the slide here. For some reason it uh, won't advance. <laughs> oh, there we go. Let's see if we can help you with a little bit of your technical challenge there. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay, that? so here we are. Okay, oh, there yeah, we are. <laughs> there we are. Off you go. Right, yeah, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't working on my end. Anyway. Okay, so I titled this uh, IoT Explained, Seeing the Value Beyond the Hype. And um, on the next slide you'll see, uh, I, I'd like to ask the question, um, what is the Internet of Things? I mean, it's a very trendy topic. Um, but in the research I've done, I've focused on the IoT for the residential customer. And the brief description I've come up with is a collection of connected devices that provide some type of control or automation. This system or system of systems provides certain benefits to the user, such as comfort, security, energy efficiency, maintenance. Essentially, it makes our lives easier and more automated. For example, <clears throat> a home monitoring system that lets you know when the door is left open inadvertently, or a smart thermostat that reacts automatically to a change in the weather. The IoT residential environment consists of a collection of intelligent devices and sensors that provide control with or without human intervention. And these pieces of high-tech hardware relay data via wired or wireless connections and often rely on intelligence from the Internet or a cloud service with some analytics. One aspect of this research has been to not focus on the Internet of everything. And why? Well, because it's just too large. And I wanted to put some context around it so our clients could understand better some of the near-term and adjacent opportunities and not get caught up in trying to do everything and to waste their efforts. So areas that have been excluded so far but could be added as this market develops are the audiovisual devices in a home and vehicles. And I've also excluded wearables and the whole healthcare segment. The main focus has been on the residential built environment or the large electrical loads such as major appliances and of course the HVAC system and controls. And as we see on the next slide, let's consider what is coming as part of the IoT trend. Quite simply, Expect to see a plethora of devices in the home, and these will connect to each other or to systems that can leverage their sensing and control capabilities. Think many more smart thermostats, meters, connected appliances, lighting, door locks, and cameras that provide security, and likely other things such as water sensors for leak detection and sprinkling systems. So the devices are one of the three big pieces of what lies ahead, and devices in some ways are the easy part. Not to say connected devices are easy, but once deployed and in place, they're simply enablers. And the next two are the ones that bring the lasting value. So another piece is the apps or the applications that control and automate the devices. 
turning connected devices into something that benefits the user. So for instance, a connected refrigerator that alerts you to a coming failure, like the water line for the ice maker is showing serious signs of a leak, and you could save a lot of hassle and damage to your flooring if you fix it real soon. Also, I'm referring to applications somewhat broadly here, and these can be device-centric and developed to work in the background, as well as apps that are accessed on mobile devices or online and that the residential customer interacts with on a more regular basis. And a final point about apps, because this hyper-connected IoT world is still quite nascent, there are likely to be a number of applications that we can't see just yet. Similar to businesses or applications that have sprung up recently like Uber or Snapchat that no one really saw ahead of time before coming into being. And a third expected development as the IoT market grows will be the related services and the companies that will aggregate these. Utilities are in a great position to offer these services, but also broadband and security companies like AT&T, Comcast, and ADT are already offering services and have plans to do more. And it's likely new market entrants will compete here as well. They just haven't surfaced yet. So the point of all this is to say the growing number of devices is one thing, but it will be the companies that can monetize and extract value over time that will win. And as we see on this uh, next slide, I'd like to point out how the IoT market is accelerating and starting to move beyond some of the hype. A case in point is the existence of smart thermostats and how these devices can be used as part of demand response programs by utilities and can be accessed by users from mobile phones, thereby being linked to both a utility system and a mobile network. A smart device connecting two seemingly disparate systems, which really underscores the point about the IoT market not being out there at some point in time. In many ways, it's here already, but we just don't call it that. Some other quick examples. Some LED lights have embedded radios now that can be used for remote control via mobile devices, and appliances or security systems that share their status for enhanced automation, safety, and convenience. So we are now seeing the idea of machine to machine, which is more of an industrial concept, move into a period where systems talk to systems and bring new value to users. We are also seeing new platforms like Google's Brillo, Apple's HomeKit, and Samsung starting to promote its SmartThings offering. Then we've seen some interesting M&A activity and big investments, which are signs the market is heating up. For example, Dialog Semiconductor's purchase of Atmel for $4.6 billion, which was clearly an IoT play. Samsung's purchase of SmartThings in 2014, and tech giant IBM planning to spend some $3 billion over the next four years. And Qualcomm investing $150 million to fund IoT startups in India. And from the demand side, consumers are starting to become more comfortable with connected devices, even though they might not call it IoT. It's clear they have a desire for the benefits. As an example, a recent Harris poll showed that smart thermostat ownership among Internet users at 11%. Notably, it's 15% among seniors, the highest among all the demos, which included millennials, Gen Xers, boomers, and seniors. Now on this next slide, I'd like to highlight some of the major players pushing the IoT trend. Companies like Alphabet Google Nest, which has led with smart thermostats and now smoke alarms, security cameras, and its cloud platform. Comcast and its Infinity Smart Home Service, Comcast officials have said they see their company as the network behind the IoT. Qualcomm, which is a big backer of the All Seen Alliance, an industry alliance backing this, this trend, and Intel, which is backing the Open Interconnect Consortium, a competing industry alliance. And retailer Lowe's is a big promoter of the IoT trend as well, and has upgraded its Iris platform for in-home device connectivity. And even Facebook, which has added support for connected devices to Parse, its mobile app development platform. So the takeaway here is that all sorts of companies, and not just the tech giants, are promoting IoT. Okay, on this next slide, I'd like to, to note some of the key market drivers, and there are quite a few of these. One is the growing availability of enhanced home security systems that go beyond traditional security and now integrate things like thermostats and lighting controls. There's also a small but growing awareness around energy management, that when a home has connected devices like thermostats, meters, or lighting, these can work together to boost energy efficiency. And there's a growing awareness of how connected devices can bring greater convenience. For example, a busy mom who can't always be at home when a child returns from school, she can now get a text message saying her child is safe. 
We also have witnessed the proliferation of mobile devices, smartphones and tablets and applications, which has created a huge expectation among consumers that in-home devices quite naturally should have an app that comes with it so it can be accessed anywhere the user wants, wants to go and has a network connection. In-home Wi-Fi networks are another key driver, enabling once static or bland devices like thermostats to connect to the Internet and share data. Plus, the growth of wide area connectivity with 3G and 4G cellular networks helps drive this ubiquitous connection to what's happening with our homes and systems. We also see falling component costs as a driver. The cost of adding a sensor to a device is now quite low, which helps drive down the final price of a device and helps push up volumes. As we see on the next slide, some of the other drivers include the power and affordability of cloud computing, which enables companies to gather and analyze data from residential IoT devices and deliver value beyond just connectivity. Also, installing and connecting to IoT devices is becoming much easier, particularly with the various wireless technologies and plug and play capabilities now available. And once connected, companies are continuing to roll out better analytics capabilities to turn the data into more insightful applications and use cases. Another positive for the market is movement on device interoperability, a topic I will address in a moment more as an inhibitor, but there are attempts to alleviate this hurdle. As an example, a global standards body called 1M2M announced last fall that nearly 30 companies had or and organizations had taken part in a testing event to help validate its Release 1 specification. Companies like Cisco, HP, Huawei, Qualcomm, and Rico. So that's a step forward. And finally, there is the insurance piece of this trend. Some insurance companies offer discounts to homeowners who have electronic security systems installed, which is not new. But now that systems are adding affordable sensing devices that can spot water leaks before major damage, the insurance company's exposure can be reduced. Now I'd like to discuss some of the IoT market barriers. These barriers include a minefield of protocols and standards that are out there which creates an interoperability problem. How do stakeholders navigate these technologies? Which ones do you go with? Which ones to ignore? And on the consumer side, having all these protocols out there only confuses people when they go to buy products and tends to stall adoption. Another hurdle is all the technology silos we see in the home, like the security system does not talk to the HVAC system, and the appliances are not connected, and it's not a trivial task to unify them in a home. To do this kind of integration has added cost, and the latest devices tend to be more expensive than existing solutions even with component prices dropping. IoT gear in general is still more costly than traditional alternatives and is likely to be so for at least the next few years. Battery life is another barrier, as some IoT devices need to function reliably for a long time on batteries, and there is uncertainty about how long those batteries need to last. Another hurdle is the fact that most consumers have vague notions about IoT products for their homes. They just aren't as tuned into this trend as we in the industry might be. And lurking at the edges of this trend are the privacy and security concerns people have, especially with the regular revelations about hacks at well-known companies like Target or the breach at Dow Jones. For a number of consumers, the idea of more devices sharing usage data only tends to fuel their worries, this despite the security layer built into IoT communications protocols. The reality is a connected home will have multiple entry points that a cyber criminal could exploit. There's also the challenge of demonstrating what the value proposition is to consumers. The IoT concept is still quite new, and many people have yet to experience the technology or to understand the potential benefits. And finally, I think we are still in a stage where much of the focus is on selling devices, which is fine, but the emphasis needs to shift to what really matters, and that is what people want most, and that's a collection of services that are, um, that are automated, easy to use, and affordable. Okay, on this next slide, I want to briefly highlight some of the current IoT protocols and platforms. I jokingly titled this slide, Can We All Get Along? And the short answer right now is, not really, or it depends. The list seems to grow and change with each passing month or quarter. Besides the familiar ones like Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, and Wi-Fi, there are plenty of others, such as Six Lopan, Thread, Sigfox, Newell, and HomeKit. With so many out there in the market, it means interoperability will be a challenge for some time. And despite efforts by some companies or standards groups with so many competitors, it will slow development and continue to confuse consumers. Okay, on the next slide, I want to pivot to our forecast for IoT devices 
And to set that up, let's look at some of the forecast assumptions for the residential IoT market. First one is that a household that adopts IoT devices tends to persist that way. So for instance, a smart thermostat that gets installed would tend to remain in place and does not revert to older technology. Another assumption is that replacement rates will vary depending on the device and its expected use case or application. So the range is from about seven years at the low end to 15 or more for something like a smart meter. Another assumption is that for most devices, like a thermostat or smart meter, it will be one per household. But for connected light bulbs or appliances, of course, there would be several of these. Service revenue is based on a monthly recurring fee similar to what security companies charge. Advanced smart meter shipments are the only type of meter included since these are the ones most likely to have access to a home area network. And finally, regional average selling prices are used to calculate revenue for devices or systems throughout. Okay, so on the next slide, we see the Navigant forecast for IoT device revenue on a global basis. And we expect the total to grow from $7.3 billion this year to nearly $68 billion in 2025, with a compound annual growth rate of 25%. In North America, the expectation is a market growing from roughly $2.5 billion in 2015 to nearly $18 billion in 2025. And for Europe, we anticipate a $2.9 billion market in 2015, growing to $24 billion in 2025. For the Asia-Pacific region, the expectation is a market starting this year at about $1.6 billion and then growing to nearly $24 billion at the end of the period. Now on this next slide, I have device shipments by type. Smart meters are expected to be the leading product type because of the anticipated large deployments coming in Europe and in Asia Pacific, plus the ongoing deployments in North America. So smart meters are expected to grow from about 44 million in 2015 to nearly 98 million in 2025, which represents a compound annual growth rate of 8.4%. Smart thermostat volumes are expected to grow from about 1.3 million to more than 29 million. Smart appliances from about 1.5 million to almost 75 million and smart lighting from nearly 6 million to 33.2 million. Now moving on to the next slide, we have the forecast for IoT penetration rates by region. And on this one, you should note that smart meters are removed since I wanted to show how the IoT trend looks from a non-utility perspective because these devices are entering homes often from that view. So we expect in North America, the rate will grow from about 4% of households in 2015 to 25% in 2025. In Europe, from about 2% to 26% of households. In Asia Pacific, from approximately 1% to about 13%. And Latin America, from below 1% to about 5%. And in the Middle East and Africa, similar to Latin America, from under 1% to around 7%. So the point here is that penetration is still quite low in all reasons and will grow at different rates depending on the drivers and the rate of technology adoptions and the overall affordability of these newer technologies. So on this next slide, I want to note some of the surprises and the doubts surrounding the IoT. First, the fact that semiconductor chips are getting smaller and smaller. Freescale has developed a super thin chip that is as thin as a blade of grass, and it's designed for low power devices like payment cards, wearables, and medical sensors, which all fit the need of the IoT, a small amount of processing in a small space. Then there are companies like OpenDesk, which is a furniture startup that has developed an internet-connected desk that acts like Dropbox, thinking and backing up files, creating an embedded digital file storing system. And there is the connected pill. It's by BodyCap, which is, um, and this pill is swallowed by a patient and allows medical technicians to monitor the internal temperature of, their, of that patient. It's pretty amazing stuff. But there's reason to also have some doubts around the IoT and be skeptical of all the hype. The idea of connected devices is not new, though the applications and amount of things connected is somewhat different. And lastly, I just want to mention one of the future outcomes of the IoT is the analytics of things, a concept from Bill Franks of Teradata, the idea that once things are connected, the real power comes from analyzing the data and making things more efficient or useful in new and helpful ways. On this next slide, I want to pivot to a recent survey done by Ericsson in which the company surveyed more than 100,000 people in some 40 countries. And the surprising result is that consumers seem to be quite open to what is coming. Half of the respondents say smartphones will die out in five years and that mobile technology as we know it will be a thing of the past by 2021, with artificial intelligence superseding many of the functions we see today. Of note is what one researcher said, consumers have a strong interest in new paradigms like artificial intelligence 
and virtual reality, and in the idea of embedding the Internet in the walls of homes or our bodies. It seems like consumers are ready for the IoT world of tomorrow. So on this next slide, I'd like to wrap up with some key takeaways. First, the IoT trend is here now, though not always described using this term, and it's accelerating. Second, there are multiple drivers of the trend, from hardware manufacturers to service providers to utilities on the supply side, to increasing awareness and early demand from consumers. Third, there are significant barriers to market growth, but these are likely to be overcome in the next decade. Fourth, we can expect slower growth for the near term with an inflection point excuse me, closer to the end of the decade with a fairly steady ramp after that. We can also expect to see new business models and opportunities for companies that can connect the devices and provide value that people are willing to pay for. Also, we can expect to see a shakeout among companies given the large number of companies playing in this space. And there is plenty of uncertainty around IoT, just like the early days of the Internet circa 1995. Finally, a really important point, once we get the devices and platforms in place, the shiny object period, if you will, the lasting value will be in the smart services that people will want and use on a consistent basis. So homes become more intelligent and efficient, and we move from the IoT to the AOT, where analytics and deeper machine capabilities create increasingly intelligent homes that are more energy efficient, comfortable, and secure. Now I'd like to turn the mic back over to Claire. Claire? Neil, thank you very much. Um, I am constantly amazed at the ability of technology to change the way that we, are, we interact with one another. Uh, it, it's amazing, first of all, and even just to think that I'm sitting at the bottom end of the world and you and Elena are sitting literally <laughs> right on the other end, and we we're able to have a conversation with hundreds of other people all around the world at the same time. Um, Elena, I'm going to allow you as the Principal Marketing Consultant with ITRON CTO Office to talk a little bit about what ITRON is doing and um, around uh, some of the developments that you are seeing specifically in the Internet of Things market. Thank you, Claire. I'm assuming that I can um, advance this slide, or will you be teeing up this slide? I think I'm going to let you take control of that. Um, that way, if you need to go back, you, you feel that you're a lot more in control of things. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here to speak with everyone today uh, on behalf of ITRON and the CTO office of ITRON. Um, about the utility perspective of the Internet of Things. Uh, I believe the uh, comprehensive overview that was just given is a perfect entry into um, my, our presentation. And I would like to uh, just provide a perspective, of an ITRON perspective of IoT and what it is. Again, just as was earlier defined, uh, we believe that uh, the Internet of Things for utilities is basically the ability to connect everything that measures. Um, a network of addressable interconnected sensors. And if you look at the view that way, then um, you, would, you would agree, as was um, stated before, that smart meters, utility meters, are nodes on an IoT network. Um, these are interconnected objects. They interoperate. They're always working together. They communicate status information. And they empower the uh, utility networks to um, disseminate, understand information, and monetize that information. And when I speak to um, people who are interested in developing services and applications for the Internet of Things, slightly different than consumers who wish to purchase these things, these are people who want to develop for um, IoT, they are concerned with um, placing um, a bet on a service or a network or a particular avenue that will uh, help them um, be successful. And one of the things that we realized early on is that ITRON has a unique ability to um, service the uh, Internet of Things market, if you will, because it's something that we've actually done since our inception. If you think about a utility network, it is robust, it is secure, it is reliable, and we have been collecting and monetizing data um, for gas, water, and electricity for many, many years. Um, when you think of the power of IoT for a utility, um, there's a number of things that come up that are uh, really wonderful. 
Um, for example, um, for energy, for water, for gas, these things can be um, more resourcefully used. We can bring in distributed energy resources in an um, intelligent way that will not only um, increase the amount of clean energy that is used by uh, service providers, but will also balance and distribute loads efficiently and in a way that um, is uh, uh, operationally efficient for electricity providers, for example. When we look, talk about the uh, Internet of Things, for cities, for municipalities, we can see services and um, products that increase public safety, uh, street lights, civil services, disaster detection, smog monitoring. When we look at IoT as applied to agriculture, specifically with water conservation, we can see intelligent um, watering, intelligent distribution of a natural resource that will promote the uh, growth of the, the, the crop, but also do so in a way that conserves the precious resource of water. When we talk about transportation and, and um, smog, for example, and, and monitoring uh, the air, um, we can look at traffic flow and parking awareness and direct drivers to places where they can park immediately instead of circling and circling and causing perhaps, you know, more contaminants in the air. Um, when we talk about IoT, we can talk about manufacturing connected enterprises and understanding exactly which of their um, uh, machines in the factory are good players and which are bad and which would maybe need to be re uh, upgraded so that they can be more energy efficient. And the same is true for medical. I believe um, the pill example that was just given is a really excellent um, demonstration of what can be done with technology um, when it comes to patient monitoring and remote monitoring and home care, making people more independent. One of the things we re realized early on, again, going back to the fact that um, we've been monetizing and, and deploying a robust and secure network for many years, is that maybe we can take a subset of our technology and apply it to the Internet of Things. So we can take our years of experience with the IoT and perhaps deploy communications and sensor technologies that are more um, appropriate for a smaller footprints, for example, that don't necessarily have metrology but may be sensing other, other things. We've taken um, our robust and reliable data management solutions and taken a subset of that to apply to IoT to accelerate information sharing and decision processes and to um, look at how we've, how we've deployed our standards and how we can partner with, with providers to um, develop some, a network with seamless connectivity and a true Internet protocol so we can um, uniquely present our uh, robust network and open it up to third-party developers. We've taken our um, what we call the uh, open way Riva for, for utilities and we've created a new um, platform for IoT called ITRON Riva. And we are allowing the utilities to leverage their experience and develop for ITRON Riva for IoT applications that are relevant and adjacent to their particular segment. And we can um, also open it up to third party developers. And we believe that doing so will enable smart cities, for example, and, and raise up the infrastructure of technology in municipalities and, and in the utility infrastructure itself. So I've mentioned the ITRON Riva platform and taking a subset of OpenWay Riva, which is for you, the utilities to address the Internet of Things and to um, use a common technology, a common uh, set of, of uh, tools and software services in order to drive new products, new applications, and new services that basically extend this utility infrastructure to the Internet of Things. Um, we have partnered, as I say, to uh, develop a multi-purpose utility network to accelerate information sharing and establish an internet protocol communication. And we have created a development kit 
that we are opening up to third parties and to the general public. It's actually available for sale as of this year so that people can develop products and services that would be then um, reviewed and accepted by ITRON to support a multi-application, multi-tenant utility and Internet of Things application. There are so many applications for smart cities and for utility infrastructures when you look at it from an IoT perspective that um, we believe that ITRON and a utility with our utility focus, it, by opening it up to third parties, can invite third parties to really help us understand all of the possibilities. From our own view, for electricity, we definitely can see a purpose for outage detection, for diversion and tamper detection, um, to look at voltage, to be able to accept and deploy distributed energy resources in a way that is managed and controlled um, to, to make sure there's no grid outages. For gas, we look at a public safety application for pipeline safety. Um, methane detection and cathodic protection, these are all very important things for a gas utility provider in order to monitor any potential sources of losses or even sources of danger. Um, by implementing uh, sensors along a gas pipeline distribution facility, they can look at um, potential, they can monitor for potential breaches, look at flow analysis and depressure monitoring, and basically do smart disconnect in the case of, of problems, in the case of uh, detected breaches or methane gas distribution. For water, it's a resourceful angle. The leak detection, of course, no one wants damage from water in their home or damage along the line. But it's also to conserve a very precious natural resource. There is a worldwide drought that's particularly hard hit in my home state of California. Um, you can look at pressure management and flow analysis that is similar to gas. Um, and you can really increase and enforce conservation management and do reporting and analysis and improve operational efficiencies actually across all of these utilities. And again, for the Internet of Things and the power that it brings for, for cities and for uh, infrastructures and for building management, this is an, a very important area that we believe that we're uniquely qualified, uniquely poised to help address. We can help, as I mentioned before, with transportation, with um, uh, pollution and, and, uh, and monitoring, with public safety. Um, one of the things that goes very unnoticed is waste management. Um, uh, by providing sensors and trash cans, we can more efficiently deploy um, the people who retrieve them, uh, retrieve the trash. And there's a lot of applications across smart cities that we can only envision and we can only open to third parties for their innovative development. As I mentioned, we took a subset of OpenWay Riva and established what we call the ITRON Riva platform, and we're selling uh, development kits to third parties. And we've actually established a website and are promoting a developer community. Um, in this way, we can promote our technology platform and give the tools that are necessary to third parties to develop products and services to extend our utility infrastructure that, again, as I mentioned, is robust, secure, reliable, and monetizable, and has been for many years. Um, we've created tools using um, open source and um, tools that are familiar to makers and people who develop um, for third-party applications on conventional platforms. We have something that looks very similar to a uh, Texas Instrument, uh, BeagleBone Black. Um, this kind of form factor and the kind of Linux tools and open source environment that is very familiar to makers. People are familiar with using Arduino boards, for example. I believe earlier we talked about the um, ac dialogue acquisition of Atmel um, being an IoT play. This is one of the things that we're um, trying to appeal to the people who work in that environment. Um, we have a forum for idea sharing, and um, we hope to accelerate application development in areas that we may not be even able to envision because we're so focused, as we should be, on our utility customers. And um, that website is live and available at itronreva.com. 
So in conclusion, I'd like to share that we believe when we think about uh, what is IoT and, you, and we take the definition of connecting everything that measures, we believe that we are in a unique p uh, position to leverage our experience and our expertise in energy and water and gas management and open that up to third parties and innovators and bring our leadership position in an in a, a utility infrastructure to third parties who are interested in accelerating the deployment of smart tools and applications um, and enable a, a generation of applications that will, will foster conservation of our natural resources and to, to accelerate smart cities and to accelerate smart agriculture and smart enterprises in building management and basically drive the uh, adoption and, of the Internet of Things to the betterment of society. Elena, thank you very much for your contribution. Um, I, I um, wanted to start off with a question that was posed by uh, one of the, the, the members of our audience. And that is, and I think this is for both of you, if, if I may, um, it's, in your view, what is going to replace mobile devices? Will it be sort of wearable IoT equipment like the Google Glasses? Um, Elena, maybe you could give us your, your, your point of view on that. Yeah, that's, that's a very fascinating question, and I paid close attention to when Neil um, put up the uh, forecast for how consumers may be ready for the next paradigm shift. There have been many paradigm shifts in the last 10 to 15 years from, um, that began actually the most notably with the smartphone where we went, from, where we went to a touch interface. And there for a while with the, with the advancement of voice control, people believed that a voice user interface would be the next control device and you would not necessarily be holding or tethered to a smartphone or a mobile device. Um, I find the idea of wearables um, to be quite intriguing and, and quite potentially possibly the next uh, type of, of device that, pe that would, might replace a smartphone. But at the same time, I the implementations I have seen have all been a device that is dependent on a smartphone. With, with response to the question about um, uh, wearing glasses, uh, it's, it's, I personally do wear corrective glasses, <laughs> and every time I've tried to use these devices, they have not been designed with people who wear corrective glasses in mind. So for me, that's a little bit of a leap myself. But I suppose I'm ready, and I think that, as Neil pointed out, consumers are very ready to embrace a new paradigm shift. I just don't think I know what it is. Yeah, I'd like to jump in there, too. I, I, think, I also wear I think it's quite an interesting, sorry, Neil, I think that's quite an interesting um, comment, is that this is such new ground for everybody. I don't think anybody really knows <laughs> what that new paradigm is going to be. Neil, sorry, I cut you off there. Um, what is your feeling on this? Yeah, yeah, quite all right. No, I, I was just going to say I also wear corrective glasses or corrective lenses, if you will, and, and I've not seen an, an implementation of a, of a Google Glass type of a, a scenario that works for me. But I think that's part of it. But also I think th there's a bit of a nuance in the, at least the study from Ericsson where um, the, you know, half the, those respondents said that the smartphone would be dead. And I think what they're saying is it's not that mobile devices go away, but they change and morph. And whether that's a wearable, whether it's a watch, whether it's um, – something you carry or wear, I think is, is an open question. And I think it's an interesting one, as, as Elena pointed out. And I just think we just don't know. I also think there's, um, there's been some technology floating around for some time, I think mainly from uh, MIT labs going back a number of years where there's a flexible display. And again, that sort of popped up over the years. We haven't seen it, but I could see that thing in our pocket today, which is a, you know, a smartphone, could morph into something that's flexible um, and, and much more you know, usable in a different way, and that the interface is touch and or, I think the, the, um, back to the respondents in that survey, that they expect screens and displays around them, whether that's in the car or in the home. And, and as Elena pointed out, you can either talk to them or, or they, they react to you as you move by them. So I think the sensors and the capabilities and the inter interfaces are going to change. And I think we're just at you know, kind of the early stages of that. And we really don't know. I mean, 10 years, who knows? You, know, you might walk into a room or sit in a car, and as we've seen, you know, the car drives itself for you. So 
Um, I think the world around us changes, and, and that mobile device, you, know, you may still carry something, but it may not be a phone or a smartphone as we see it. It may be just more, more embedded in our lives in a different way. Well, I suppose that, that is kind of, um, we're already seeing an extension of that with the implementation of um, smart watches that are, while yes, still connected yeah. to your, your cell phone, are also able to provide some of that interconnectivity in a way that perhaps even, I don't know, two years ago we wouldn't have necessarily thought about. Uh, I remember when, uh, you know, uh, in the 1980s, I'm giving my age away here, but in the 1980s, there was a big move to putting television and uh, radios on watches, and that kind of became passe very quickly. And it's interesting to see that we are, are coming, I guess, almost, almost full circle in terms of um, our, our, our wearables could become very small, then they become big. If you look at the size of cell phones when they first started, started out and, and how they've evolved um, to the point where they were literally um, you know, a couple of centimeters long and now, of course, they, they're getting bigger and bigger every time. So it, it's very interesting to see how our technology is evolving around how we use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's one other aspect that, again, um, there's experimentation or, or trial and testing of 5G networks. Again, what does that mean? It's still kind of undefined, but, you know, the speeds and capabilities of future networks which enable uh, data to move around at faster and faster speeds and in smaller and smaller, you know, sensors and whatnot. So I, I just think we, you know, it's, it's up to kind of the futurologists or the science fiction fans to, to sort of dream up what's next. And the, the reality in 10 years is going to be probably quite different than what we think of today, but something along those lines. And, and again, as you say, you, you go back to the 80s, well, that's quite a few decades ago, and you, you fast forward 10 years, that's maybe not enough that, you know, you go forward 20 or 30 years and, um, a lot more possibilities are out there. So I would agree. It's, it's, it's pretty hard to say, but I think this IoT trend is just, it's just not going to go away for a long time. Other questions? So I'm, I believe we may have lost the audio from the presenter, but I'm still here. Ne Neil? Yeah, I'm here. This is Neil. Yeah, I'm here. Are you there, Elena? I guess we, yes. <laughs> somehow we lost. I, I, <laughs> I see. I see. We have we have a question um, uh, from uh, from Jay, and uh, it looks like he would like to know from me. Um, does iTrom look at market beyond metering and becoming more of an IoT company? Um, that's a very good question. And I would like to say that uh, as a foundation of our strategy um, for approaching anything, um, metering and uh, communications for utilities is the foundation of ITRON's approach. Um, the approach towards IoT, as I said, was to be able to take a subset of our technologies that we use for metering and um, open the, the uh, utility infrastructure to third parties. We believe anything that can help us be a more resourceful world um, is an important addition and a welcome addition to the infrastructure. So rather than saying that we would become an IoT company, I would actually go back to my initial um, uh, thesis is that we have always been uh, an Internet of Things company because we have a, a millions of um, sensors that we have been pulling and collecting 
and um, uh, distributing information from. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a question about what utilities need to know about security for the IoT, and, and uh, Elena, definitely jump in on that. I think I think utilities actually have been very good um, overall in, in security, and, and, and you know there there may be slow paces to their benefit. They they've not tried to do everything, and to, you know they've taken a a fairly cautious approach. I think um, you know with smart meters themselves, you know ensuring security there, and I think as they they delve into um, smart cities and, and connecting more devices that they're very, very concerned about security as they should be. And I think so far they've done a pretty good job. I think the problem is that when these IoT devices that come in from other angles, either from the consumer side or from, from other companies, that, that, that not that they're not concerned about security, but there's just lots of them, you know, some, some consumer or a large group of people puts in connected lighting or connected something, whether that's thermostats or, or appliances, what have you, that there are just that many more entry points that potentially a, a, you know, a bad actor could try to exploit. Um, there haven't been you know, major breaches, but you, know, you look around the Internet and, and major companies are, are seeing you know, backdoors hacked all the time. And I just think that, that it's an ongoing concern. I don't think it, it kills off the marketplace for the IoT, but I just think it's one of those areas where um, manufacturers and, and software providers and, and service providers and utilities all have to be very diligent in, in demanding, you know, first and foremost, high security at, at, at the, the highest level they can get it, you know, and, and then still make the product useful and, and helpful. So it's a balancing act, I think, and I don't think there's, a, there's no perfect system when you have um, the Internet involved or, or, or that much connectivity, but you have to state it or, or set it as a very high priority and then act on that and then be very diligent over time. And, and then, you know, when, when bad actors, you know, take action, you, you um, go after them and, and you plug those holes and, and, and move on. I don't know, Elena, do you have a perspective on that? Oh, I would completely agree. I mean, there's nothing more important to security when you're talking about natural resources and you're talking about um, making sure that, that no one can hack the, the grid, for example. Um, this is something we take very seriously at ITRON and we are very vi vigilant about. Um, we are very, um, I think we're, we're very proud to say that uh, some of the more notable um, breaches and hacks uh, in the last few years we've managed to avert. And as a matter of fact, where any part of those breaches um, with re respect to, I believe one of the last ones was a, um, was a piece of code in a router. We uh, did not implement that piece of code in our routers, but we still felt the obligation to notify all of the utilities of the potential for um, a breach. And we were proactive rather than reactive in informing our communities of these things. So we're very, very um, focused on security. It is actually the um, responsibility of the office of the CTO where I work to make sure that we are vigilant in that regard. Um, thank you, Elena. Um, I do apologize, everybody. I had a little bit of a technical problem <laughs> with with my telephone line after telling uh, everybody how brilliant technology was. It then went and failed me. So I do apologize for the the silence um, on my on my part. Uh, Elena and Neil, thank you so much for for picking up there for me. Uh, we've got a number of questions, um, and I there's one from Philippe, which um, is. You've explained that the IoT moving world is large and complex and that ITRON has built an open architecture. Um, can you elaborate more on the standards and partners you've chosen to work with to make that happen? So, Elena, this one is for you. Well, yes, okay. Um, yes, we have. Our approach to uh, IoT is to deliver robust and reliable networks, and we have um, developed a, a adaptive communication technology and partnered with people such as Cisco. So Philippe, I see you are with Cisco, so thank you for bringing that up. I, um, and forgive me for not naming Cisco as our partner. But that's one of the things that we are very, um, very focused on is to use uh, true IP communications, to use um, very powerful and solid partners who are as committed to open standards as we are and um, build an architecture using open source and Linux and tools that are very familiar to people who develop uh, applications and software and services. 
And so um, this is the kind of open architecture that we're working with, and Cisco is one of our, our partners that we are very proud to work with and um, who shares our vision for, um, for wireless communication standards and IP uh, communication standards. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Neil, I think I'm going to uh, direct this next question to you, and it's from Ingrid, who wants to know, what does it take to unleash the IoT or smart home potential to the mass, to the mass market? Uh, for the time being, the solutions around are expensive. You need experts to get the installations done. Each individual a device needs to be programmed, and you need a big budget. Um, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think that, um, that at least today, I think the key point is you have to start somewhere, and and that and it doesn't take much more than a device or two to become an IoT home, if you will. So installing a smart thermostat, um, per, maybe purchasing a few, maybe maybe a handful of, of connected smart light bulbs, um, that sort of thing, or maybe a sensor for for water detection, that kind of thing. So I, I do think, and I agree. I think that there's not a there's no one size fits all because um, each home and homeowner may have different ideas of what they want to automate or, or connect in a new way. So I think it starts kind of as a, as a one-off or, or, or a set of things like light bulbs, and it can grow from there. And, and I've, uh, you know, in the last couple of months, I've, just, I've talked to some contacts and friends and neighbors, and I was at CES, and, and I, I think it's actually getting easier. The prices aren't necessarily falling quickly, but, but you can get into a connected device, a smart thermostat. Yes, you know, they tend to be you know, at the high end, $250, but some of them are now $100 or somewhere in that range. Uh, a set of uh, connected light bulbs may be around $100. So, I mean, the entry point, it's still more than you would go out and, and buy a single bulb for, for example. But I think it's starting to break down at the edges and that to get in, it's, you, you start at a starting point and then you add things from there. So, um, you know, you start with a thermostat perhaps or, or light bulbs a security system, again, there are some affordable security systems that don't cost a lot of money, although maybe several hundred dollars. So I think people can start wherever it fits their needs. They want to connect their security system, they want to connect um, a thermostat, they want to connect light bulbs. So I think it starts with one of those areas and then can grow from there. The question is, if you buy that thermostat today, will it connect with lights in the, you know, the next purchase you make in, in maybe six months or a year? Will it connect to the, the uh, smart plugs? Will it connect to uh, an appliance you buy maybe two or three years down the road? And I think that's the key for, for manufacturers and, and or enablers like Comcast or, or uh, AT&T or, or ADT, companies like that. Can they uh, bring together a, co a combination of products that work and interoperate? And, and I think we're getting there, but it's just going to take time. Okay. Um, Elena, I have a question here for you from Dave, who says that um, he wants to know how Artron will manage the privacy issue with ratepayers and utilities with your IoT platform, and if it involves ratepayer data or access. Um, he says, it seems that Green Button has been a slow mover in extending simple utility data to customers and third parties. New companies have emerged to do this on a paid model, perhaps exploiting this inefficiency. How will iTron's approach get around these obstacles? Well, that's a, you know that is a very good question. This is one of the reasons that we've opened up the iTron Riva Developer Network to third parties, is because we want to make sure that we are um, able to uh, develop products and services that we are not necessarily uh, laser focused on, so one of these um, one of these might be this uh, ratepayer type of, of application. And when it comes to privacy issues, that's that's a different type of, of question and concern. We have implemented a layer of security. Our first board our first boards are just uh, for um, developers to to get familiar with it. But we will have our iTron security in in our um, developer kits going forward. Um, I, I guess I would ask for clarification on what is meant by privacy. Um, all of the data is anonymized that we use um, in, over our network, so that's one layer of privacy, but I'm not quite sure what the question is after. Okay, well, I'll, I'll provide you with Dave's details, and Dave, um, Elena can probably get in touch with you directly and perhaps give you some, some more insights into that question. Um, an interesting question here from Gerald is, 
are there any opportunities for utilities and wearable technology? So this is definitely one that's a little bit um, futuristic, and um, I'm going to open that one up to both of you. Elena, ladies first. Yeah, I think actually that's a great question. Um, one of the things that we're looking <laughs> at is, is uh, the field service technicians, for example, they are they're still um, even even with a fixed network, even with remote um, sensing and and uh, remote uh, data uh, feedback. There's still times where you have a, a field service representative that has to go and t uh, trouble check um, a system, a meter, for example. And um, one of the things that we're looking at is the ubiquity of mobile phones and smartphones to do field service applications, but I, that can easily be abstracted, especially with smartwatches, to wearable technology. One of the things that uh, will um, determine the penetration of wearables in a, in a field environment, of course, is their you know, ruggedness. I mean, these things are, this is a, um, you know, down and dirty, and, and people sometimes use wrenches and things like that, and you want to make sure that whatever it is that's deployed can survive a, a fall, a break, or, you know, being, um, uh, it has to be a rugged type of thing. And I'm not sure that you would want an Apple Watch on um, your field service technician, but I, I do see um, uh, a potential for using wearables in, a, in the field personnel. Apart from that, I'm not quite sure what else we could do with it. I think that um, uh, reading a meter, doing a contingency read, um, servicing uh, um, or actually installing some, a, a device, um, all of that would, be, would involve field personnel and, and um, the data that could be on either a smartphone or a wearable is, uh, is, poss is feasible. But beyond that, I'm not sure I can see an application. I'll take a okay, stab at that from, uh, yeah, from the residential side. Um, I think that, again, it will probably come down to utilities partnering with some entity. For example, I could see uh, utilities, if they're allowed, but partnering maybe with a healthcare provider or some in-home uh, provider where a wearable is connected to healthcare and, and the utility is somehow connected you know, through the meter or through, the, through data sharing or, or that sort of a scenario, um, or they partner with um, maybe a, a broadband provider like uh, AT&T or what have you, and, and wearable technology is, is used uh, for sensing and when people are in the home, it maybe controls the, the HVAC system, that kind of thing. But I don't see it as a huge revenue opportunity. Maybe it's a revenue share possibility. But again, you'd have to tie it into some sort of service revenue, I think, on the, on the, um, the consumer side. Because you know, a one-off wearable, I don't, I don't see utilities getting into selling wearables. So I think they'd have to partner at some point. But I think there, there is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it's a huge one. Okay. Um, then Edward uh, has said here that discussions seem to center around using the Internet as a backbone for feedback. Any comments about the LTE machine-to-machine -machine implication that appears to be a more secure solution? And he wants to know, is there a lot of value in the data security it offers? I know that we have covered this a little bit, but perhaps um, both of you or one of you would like to comment on this? Yeah, sure. This is Neil. I'll take that uh, real quickly, and then Elena, you can jump in. I, um, yeah, nothing wrong with LTE as a... As a um, as a, as a secure solution, it's just that how, does, how do you connect that with the Internet uh, you know, when devices are, are uh, traveling over a Wi-Fi network and then to, a, onto a, you know, a, maybe a wired network, um, you then have to embed an LTE chip in that device, and, and that gets to be somewhat of a complex issue. I think it could be done. I just think that you know, it has some physical as well as uh, monetary challenges uh, to try to do that. But I suppose if you aggregated the data and then sent it over an LTE uh, network, that, that could work. Um, especially if it's if it's more machine to machine in in the background, but not uh, not so much human inter intervention. Okay, Elena, do you do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? Um, no, I think that pretty much covers it. Okay, then Drew, who is uh, joining us all the way from Australia, wants to know. Do you see meters themselves being an important part of the evolution of the Internet of Things and MOT? For example, rather than measuring kilowatt hours, bidirectional flows, and the intervals that the consumption is used at a household level, what, um, what would be involved into the measurement of things uh, providing readings on major appliances at the next level within the household? Um, Elena? Would you like to take this one? 
Sure. This is an example of the type of question and the type of thoughts that are provoked when you think about opening the global utility network to third parties. And I really think uh, the was it Drew? Thank you, Drew, for asking this question. Um, one of the things that ITRON did when we um, uh, first conceived of a developer kit based on our, a subset of our technologies was we put ourselves as best we could in third-party shoes and, uh, and tried to figure out what would we develop for it if we were looking to um, make a, a, a product or service that was an extension of the utility network. And so we created something called the Solar Gate, which is essentially an Internet of Things gateway that sits on the side of the home. And it is designed for three uh, consumers of this type of, of uh, data. And the type of data uh, we're talking about here is not just metrology data and not just um, consumption data, but it's also um, production data, for example, for the solar for the solar installation, and it is also um, a gateway that would redirect uh, overproduction of solar energy, in this particular case of the solar gate, to appliances and things in the home. So when you're talking about um, looking at household usage of household devices and readings on major appliances, um, and combining that with readings, for example, of your solar produced energy and maybe readings of your um, consumed energy from the electricity utility, this is a, a terrific way of managing all of those resources and taking all of those readings and operating your home in a very efficient way. So um, when, I, when you ask, do we see the meters themselves being an important part of the evolution, as ITRON, of course we do, we absolutely do, and we think that they're an important part because of the equation of um, giving power to the consumer, the homeowner, to use um, you know, solar produced energy in this case or even any other kind of distributed energy resource that they may want to use, that they have a right to use, and do it in a way that uh, is um, efficient, that is uh, respectful of the, um, of the grid, of, the, of, of the, how, how fragile the electricity grid really is in some cases, and um, gives power to the um, electricity utility to enable the, the consumer to produce their own electricity in a way that's balanced and they manage their own resources. And for the solar leasing companies in this example, it gives them a, an ability to uh, maintain their, um, especially in the case where they've leased the system to the homeowner, maintain their, um, their uh, systems in a, uh, efficiently, operationally efficiently, and also be able to uh, monetize the, the resource that they've installed on the homeowner's um, home in a way in, in partnership with the, the homeowner. So when you talk about appliances in the home that are Wi-Fi enabled, anything from a refrigerator to a washing machine, and I've even seen, believe it or not, a Wi-Fi controlled um, crock pot. <laughs> we we definitely see the um, the, the meters and and your uh, as an important part of the equation. Be, before I experienced uh, my my technical challenge on on this side of the world, I was actually just mentioning about the fact that uh, we are seeing uh, such an increase in in technology and and the kind of things that are now uh, connected to the internet that. Uh, literally, there, there is a, a, a company in England that is selling a smart kettle where you can actually turn your kettle on when you are, say, two minutes away from home so that when you walk through the door, the kettle has boiled, um, to things such as um, smart doorbells, uh, believe it or not, um, and refrigerators. So, you know, I, I, think, I think literally <laughs> uh, we're limited by the scope of our imagination when it comes to to um, the Internet of Things and what it's going to mean for us. Um, Neil, I have a question for you here from Sinead, who wants to know, what is your view on how providers or utilities are proposing to manage or mitigate the increased data protection compliance risks and issues identified as one of the key barriers to successful rollout of IoT, bearing in mind that there needs to be a true value proposition for businesses? Um, this is particularly so given the increasing privacy regulatory obligations on utilities and, in, and indeed uncertainty on, on cross-border transfers, particularly for U.S. providers. She wants to know, do you have any thoughts on this? Wow, that's a long question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, try to, I'll try to parse it out. Um, 
I, you know, the short answer is it's hard. I mean, there, there are, you know, regulations in place um, both for providers and utilities and, and, you know, how do they manage that risk? I think that they have to stay, they take it on and they, they have to, you know, have it, have it as a very high priority and they have to follow whatever local regulations, you know, local, regional, and national that are in place. And, and I think that, um, you know, the key barrier is, is to, uh, I don't know if it's a barrier, but I think the key, the key question is you have to design security and at the get-go from the device at the device level and then at the service level and then and make sure you deliver on it. And I think, um, you know, as Elena pointed out, uh, from a utility perspective, that's, you know, they've done that with their partners for, for a long, long time and have, have had a pretty good track record as far as I know. And I think, uh, I think the other step that she mentioned, and I'll underscore it, is you have to be proactive. Um, you know, she mentioned about seeing some, you know, potentially a nefarious code or something, and, and they were proactive in alerting their, their partners or, or their, their customers on that. And I think that's the, the route you have to take. You have to be very diligent and proactive, and it's not a one-time check the box and you're done. I think security is, this, is an onco ongoing effort. And I think, you know, is it a barrier? Um, it, it, I think it's a challenge, not, not, not necessarily a barrier, but I think it's one that has to be taken very seriously and, and uh, acted on. Uh, consistently and, and, and maintained over time, and, and, and you have to be flexible. I mean, today's security will look different uh, from from that in the next uh, two or three years. It just, you know, the, the bad actors are out there pushing the limits all the time, and I think, you know, we've seen that in so many hacks, whether it's governmental or or uh, breaches at, at private companies, and it just it just goes on and on. So I don't think there's an easy, you know, one-size-fits-all solution here. It's just that you have to be diligent. I hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure it does, and uh, Sinead, if you need to get hold of uh, Neil to discuss this further, I'd be happy to share his contact details with you. Um, I, think, I think that uh, security is probably going to become one of the biggest um, challenges, but also p potentially one of the biggest opportunities for, um, for the, the supportive community uh, to, to work on. Um, so our last question, because unfortunately we, um, I've been given the, 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 the time's up signal, um, and this is from AJ, um, and he wants to know, does individual metering um, or is individual metering required at the device level? And he says, well, what I mean here is, for example, IoT for lamps or lights. Is the metering required for every light? And how does ITRON specifically see a role for this at um, a level of non-utility applications? Well, I, so, I Elena, I'm going to pass this one to you. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Jay, for the question. And again, this is one of the reasons that we've opened up the ITRON Riva uh, community to third-party developers. Um, we do see uh, building man management as a very important vertical in the Internet of Things. Um, I would respond that metering at the light level is what I would call a building energy management uh, use case. What, what, why people would do this, again, goes back to my explanation. One moment, please. Uh, what, it goes back to my explanation about um, uh, figuring out who the bad players are. So when you talk about metering at a device, whether it's a light or, or um, a, a dishwasher or something like that, the reason you would want to do that is to make sure that you are um, operating your home efficiently and determining on a very micro level what your um, usage is so that you can, um, so you can lower your utility bills or use your electricity more efficiently. Um, I don't I don't see a role for ITRON going into this market, but I do see a role for third parties using ITRON's technology uh, to use uh, to innovate and develop um, micro metering, if they will, or if not micro metering in, in, in terms of a, of a, a cash grade meter, but at least in terms of being able to identify those devices in the home that can, that are over consuming electricity. Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned, unfortunately, we, we have run out of time, and I know that there are still a number of questions that haven't been answered. Uh, to our audience, I would like to say thank you so much for your very keen interest in, in, in this particular webinar today. Your interaction has been absolutely amazing. Um, I just wanted to end off with some interesting statistics that um, have been highlighted over the course of, of the last couple of months 
from a uh, Internet of Things perspective. And uh, for instance, Forrester um, have just released a new report called the Internet of Things Q1. And in this, they report that IoT will create massive volumes of time series data, and IoT analytics will become a very specialized category and discipline. Now, this is in a world where we are already battling uh, to understand the amount of data that's already coming at us. So it's going to be very interesting to see how, how we manage this process going forward. Uh, Machina Research also believes that the need for an IoT push from a C-level executive will be met as at least one Fortune 500 company appoints a chief IoT officer. And Gartner reports that spending on IoT services will reach um, up to $235 billion in 2016, up 22% from 2015. Um, and, uh, Neil, as I'm sure you, you mentioned a little bit earlier in terms of the number of connected devices, we are looking at numbers such as something like $6.4 billion uh, connected things uh, being in use worldwide in 2016, uh, reaching as many as 20.8 billion in 2020. And uh, as just as another interesting fact, they, they, they estimate that 5.5 million new things will be connected to the Internet of Things every single day. So from me, um, I just wanted to say that the IoT sector is going to be a growing industry to watch. Uh, with anything from internal temperature monitoring in the medical field to its use in utilities and agriculture. If you have any stories or case studies that you'd like to share, please feel free to contact us. Um, you can contact me at Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, at metering.com. Uh, to you, Elena and Neil, I'd really like to say thank you for your input and time today. Um, the on-demand on broadcast and slides will be available tomorrow on our website, metering.com, and you're welcome to listen to this again and to uh, download the slides. To both of you and to our audience, thank you for your input and have a wonderful day further. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye.